But this morning we are studying once again the first letter that the Apostle Peter wrote to the groups of Christians who were living in what is now Turkey, but this was back in the year uh, around AD 60, the early 60s, so this was called Asia Minor back then. And right now we're in the part of the letter that's all about commands, the instructions for Christians about how to live life the way that they should. First part was all about that hope that we have in Jesus, who we are in him, the wonderful promises he's made to us. The second part is all about how to live in light of that hope. We'll be studying five verses in that section today, just five. First Peter 1, 17 through 21. And something that's interesting about these five verses in this command section is that in these five verses, there's only one command, one command only. Conduct yourselves with fear. It's right there in verse 17, conduct yourselves with fear. Now, does this command strike anyone here today as just, just a little bit odd? Because if you've read much, much of the Bible, you'll know that most of the time, when the Bible talks about fear, we're being told not to do it, right? F- fear not. It's actually the most repeated command in the Bible, and there are over 350 times is what I read. So why is Peter telling Christians in verse 17 here to do the exact opposite of that? You know, not conduct yourselves with confidence, but conduct yourselves with fear. What's going on here? To fear or not to fear? That is the question. And I'm going to tell you that the answer is yes. Because what Peter is warning against in these verses is not just like a general lack of fear, but the lack of fear that develops when you have a distorted view of reality. For example, let us say that you have two 15-year-old twin nephews named Dudley and Danny, and for some inexplicable reason, their parents have asked you to teach these two twin boys how to drive. Even more inexplicably, you've agreed to do it. So they've both got their learner's permits. You're standing with them in the back of the Home Depot parking lot on a Saturday morning, ready to drive. Now, the first thing that you're going to need to do as their driving teacher is figure out what sort of stuff these kids know about driving in cars. Because depending on their point of view, you're going to go about the task of teaching them very differently. Let's say that the first kid, Dudley, he is absolutely just mortally terrified of anything with wheels, okay? He was in like some sort of freak tricycle accident, you know, when he was four years old, and for whatever reason, the trauma of that event has been transferred to riding in cars. So to this day, Dudley, he gets all sweaty and shaky every time he buckles in. Right now, he is just trembling with dread, absolutely sick at the thought of being the one in the driver's seat. So let me ask you, you're trying to teach this kid how to drive. What sort of last-minute instructions would you give to Dudley before you handed him the keys? What sort of last-minute advice would you tell him? What would you say to this kid who's having a borderline panic attack right now in the Home Depot parking lot? Now, Danny, on the other hand, is Dudley's twin brother. And Danny, he is another story altogether. Danny is a video game enthusiast. He spends hours every day just hammering away on the controller of his PS4. His favorite game, Need for Speed 2016. Favorite movie, The Fast and the Furious, parts one through nine box set. His PS4 username, Moto Madman 999. Oh, and he shows up for his driving lesson wearing this t-shirt with the sleeves cut off and a pair of leather racing gloves. So what would you say to Danny? What last-minute advice or instruction would you give before handing the keys of your minivan off to Moto Madman 999? You guys see what I'm getting at here? Both Dudley and Danny are operating from distorted views of reality, and both of those views need to be corrected. That's why you have these two opposite commands in the Bible, to fear or to fear not, because they both address different distorted views of reality. The command for Dudley would be, 
Fear not. The car is not going to hurt you. I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. The command for Danny, be afraid, young man. Be very afraid. This is not a video game. The consequences are real. And if there is one scratch on my minivan when this day is over, you're going to be mowing my lawn for the next 10 years, kid. So your job as a driving teacher is to make sure that each of these kids has an appropriate understanding of the potential consequences of their behavior. Not an overblown understanding like Dudley has, not a minimalized, minimized understanding like Danny has, but an appropriate understanding. It's actually how I define the kind of fear that we're talking about today in your notes there. It is an appropriate understanding of the potential consequences of your behavior. And what I'm going to have you ask yourself today is this. Do I have that? Do, do I really know and understand the consequences of how I choose to live my life? Or have I become too much of a Dudley or too much of a Danny? In other words, am I approaching life with an appropriate degree of fear? And if no, why not? If you're here this morning and maybe you're feeling more like Dudley today, you feel burdened by anxiety or fear, or despair, I, I am sorry, but this sermon today is not really for you. There, there are things that we're going to talk about today that you may find encouraging, but, but Peter's really not writing for the Dudleys of the world in this part of the letter. He's writing for the Dannys, those of us who do not fear enough. Because it is very easy to just kind of coast through life on autopilot, really, and make decisions, have relationships, just do our thing without even really thinking about it. It's so easy and it is so deadly. What Peter wants to make clear to us today is that a lack of fear is just as bad as too much fear, maybe even worse, actually, because you don't even know it that you're headed to destruction. A lack of fear is a symptom of ignorance. You can go ahead and write that down. It's important. Lack of fear is a symptom of ignorance. Take driving in the snow, for example. I'm going to keep sticking with the automobile references today. Cause it's kind of the theme. The first time that I ever drove my car in the snow, I was 17 years old, and I ended up in the ditch. Why? It's because I didn't know anything about driving in the snow. I, I was on my way to work, I had the music up, was sipping my coffee, tapped the brakes when I was driving down this little hill, my car spun 90 degrees, and I ended up with my nose right in the ditch. My problem was a lack of fear, and my lack of fear was caused by my ignorance. I simply didn't know that you should not hit the brakes on an icy hill, that you should you know, keep both hands on the wheel, and that driving in the snow is a whole different ball game than just driving around in the rain. And because of that ignorance, I had to pay the consequences. And so did my little Corolla, unfortunately. She was collateral damage. Well, after today's sermon, none of you here will have the ignorance excuse for your lack of fear. Not that it's really a valid excuse in the first place, but you're not going to have it anymore. That is because Peter supports this main command to conduct yourselves with fear with some specific reasons why that's a good idea. I actually have five of these reasons listed in your notes there, and, and I want you to think of those five reasons as reality checks. You know, if, if too much fear or too little fear comes from a distorted view of reality, like Dudley and Danny both had, Peter wants to give us the right view in this passage. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to work our way through this passage, 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. We're just going to go through it verse by verse. We're going to highlight each of these reality checks and explain how they should motivate you to conduct yourself with fear. So go ahead and crack open your Bibles with me if you've got them. I'm, going to go, I'm just going to read straight through the passage, but I'm going to start back at verse 13. This is actually the passage that uh, Bruce preached on last week leads right into the passage that we're studying today. So that's definitely where we need to start. Verse 13. Therefore, that word, that word marks a big important shift in the, the book of 1 Peter, which Bruce talked about last week. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, 
Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So the first reality check that Peter gives us, it's right there in verse 17. If you don't conduct yourselves with fear, you don't realize what kind of father you have. Because the God who is our father is also our judge. And he doesn't play favorites. It's kind of a touchy subject that Peter's bringing up here. I was was talking to someone about this topic just two weeks ago today, actually. We were having lunch together. And the question of... God's judgment came up. Specifically, the guy I was talking to wanted to know if there's going to be some sort of hierarchy in heaven among Christians. The example he gave was, you know, what if a guy like Ted Bundy came to Jesus just at the last hour before he was executed? He received forgiveness. Will he be treated the same in heaven as someone like William Carey or or other great people who just devoted their entire lives to service in the name of Jesus Christ? You know, are we all going to have the same spot at the table? Will we all have the same number of jewels in our crowns? Or or will there be some sort of heavenly hierarchy? You know, with uh, Earl down at one end of the table with C.S. Lewis, St. Augustine, and Randy down at the other end with whoever invented red light cameras, you know? (laughs) Is that the way it's going to be? To what extent will we as Christians be held responsible for our actions? If Jesus forgives us, isn't that it? Or do we face some kind of pseudo-purgatory before actually going into all the joys of heaven? When the guy asked me this a couple weeks ago, I pretty much had to tell him I didn't know how this was all going to work out specifically. I I was puzzled then, I'm still puzzled now, but the good news is that the Bible does give us some very specific, important truths related to this issue, and the Bible is very clear about them. The first of these is that if you're a follower of Jesus, if you have been united to him by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you will in no way be punished for any of your sins. Not your past sins, not your present sins, not your future sins. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. And it's not like God's just being a lazy judge here, you know, letting you off the hook. The reason you're not condemned is because your sins have already been punished. Jesus paid the death penalty for them, so you don't have to pay anything for them ever again. So that's the first thing that the Bible's really clear about. Christians will not be punished for their sins in the afterlife. Second, all believers, from the thief on the cross to the person who's never missed a Sunday at church in their life, All believers will receive the same mind-blowing inheritance of of glorification. If you were here last month, um, I preached a whole message on exactly what specifically glorification involves. This hope has been the theme of pretty much all the sermons that we preached here in January. So you can go back and listen to those as well. But some of what this involves is, is a new body, freedom from sin, freedom from disease, perfect happiness and unity and peace for all eternity in the face-to-face presence of Jesus. That's the essence of heavenly joy, and every believer will get to experience that without qualifications and without exceptions. Things do get a little bit more confusing when we talk about the third thing that the Bible is clear about. That is, the followers of Jesus will be rewarded when God judges us, and not all believers will receive the same reward. Good example of this is the parable that Jesus tells in Luke 19, when the master gives his servants some money to invest, and they all get different rewards when he returns based on how well they invested it. 
So with these three truths in mind and in view, what I think Peter's referring to in this passage is the danger that we face as followers of Jesus of forfeiting some of our heavenly reward by living our lives in a careless manner. God is our Father. God is also our judge. In other words, what you do as a follower of Jesus actually matters. There are consequences to it, not just now, but for eternity. Therefore, conduct yourself with fear. Now, there's probably like a dozen questions buzzing around in your mind right now relating to rewards and judgment and all that. And I I really do wish I had time to go into all the details right now. But for one, I don't know them all. And two, it's really not the main point of this passage. But there is one question that I think I should address before we move on. And it is that, won't the fact that some people have better heavenly rewards than others kind of spoil our experience of heaven? You know, if, if I'm there with my little crown... I see Pat Honan over there at the other end of the table with his big old crown. Won't I feel some regret that I didn't try to be more faithful? You know, won't I feel bad that I didn't try to love my neighbor or my, or, you know, love my neighbor more as myself or be more generous with my money? And isn't it possible that I could actually feel some hints of jealousy or envy or even worse, actual spite toward Pat for the big old crown on his head? It's kind of like the old ice cream conundrum. You know, you and your brother both get ice cream from your parents. You should both be happy, right? Well, not if little Jimmy got two scoops and you only got one. It would have been better if neither of you had received ice cream at all. Well, I have three answers to that question. First of all, it is better to think of these rewards that we'll be receiving as honor-based rather than material-based. So what, what this means is that the worth of your reward has more to do with who's giving it to you than what you're actually getting. So you're not going to be too caught up in, you know, what do these rewards actually consist of. Second, you have to remember that when we receive these rewards, we'll all be glorified too. What, what this means is that sinful attitudes will not be a part of our lives anymore. It will be impossible for you to be envious or jealous or spiteful or embarrassed. So when, when you see Pat's big old crown, you're going to be just as happy for him as if, as if you'd gotten it. And really, what you're going to do is you're just going to turn right around and praise the God who gave it to Pat in the first place. It's hard for us to imagine now, but that really is the way that we're going to think. You got two scoops? What a blessing. Praise be to the God who gives us ice cream. Finally, when you're in heaven, you will be more aware than ever that you don't deserve any rewards at all. You know, even, even the good things we do, we do by the power of God's Spirit working within and with us. If God was going to be fair, it really would be no reward for any of us. Even the smallest smile from Jesus, the most trivial word of praise is just going to be enough to bring you to your knees in overwhelming delight. So then imagine what it might be like for the King of the universe in all of his glory to look you in the eye and say, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. Trust me, you are going to be so overcome by that experience that you are not going to be giving a second thought to comparing your reward to whatever anybody else is getting. And it will be incredible. So I do hope that you still have some questions about this topic. Uh, One of my jobs as a teacher is to help pique your interest in the Bible with the hope you'll be interested enough to actually go and study this on your own. And in my opinion, there, no time ever spent, waste, spent thinking about heaven is ever wasted time. So I'm going to leave the topic, move on in the passage, but for now, make sure that you don't miss this reality check that Peter's giving to us. Your actions have eternal consequences. Even for those of us who are fully forgiven followers of Jesus, this is not a practice run. There are no do-overs. Therefore, conduct yourself with fear. So that's reality check number one. The God who is your father is also your judge. Reality check number two is this. If you don't conduct yourself with fear, then you don't realize the danger of your environment. Peter highlights this point really with just one word, right? Right at the end of verse 17. Exile. Conduct yourselves with fear during the time of your exile. 
This is now the second time that Peter has used this word in the letter, and it's a very important theme of 1 Peter. If you are a Christian, you are a citizen of Jesus' kingdom. That means that right now, you are not at home, and you are living in a hostile environment. You need to watch your back. A, a couple years ago, uh, Shauna and I read through uh, this book about Ernest Shackleton. It was called Endurance. Has anyone here ever read that? It's a great one. Just a few. You should, you should go check it out. Very worth reading. It was about um, the guy who led an expedition for Great Britain to the South Pole in 1914. And this expedition was just a disaster. The ship got trapped in ice and uh, this, this, pretty much right away. And they had to spend the whole first winter clinging to life in absolutely the worst conditions imaginable. There's starvation, exposure, drowning, infection, hypothermia, hypothermia depression. Well, the, the stuff that these guys had to endure over that first winter it really just boggles the mind. And as we read through this part of the book, I kept thinking, you know, how on earth could this environment possibly get any more hostile? Everything is out to kill them. They might as well be living on the moon or something, but then just wait, it does get more hostile. Just when things were starting to look better, spring was just around the corner, one of the guys from the expedition went out hunting for penguins on the ice floe behind their camp. They were pretty much eating raw penguins all the time. It's disgusting. Anyway, the guy, he's just out there trotting along the ice, when all of a sudden, what he describes in his journal as the head of a monstrous sea monster comes bursting out of the ice right in front of him. So naturally, the guy, he takes off running in the other direction when all of a sudden, boom, the thing comes right out of the ice again, this time in front of him on the other side. It's just a terrifying experience. The thing had big old four-inch long fangs that were glittering in the Antarctic sunlight, the guy wrote. Turns out that he was being attacked by a sea leopard, which is also known as a leopard seal. It's pretty much just a monstrous carnivorous seal on steroids. They actually kill penguins by bursting through the ice like this and, and devouring them all at once. And the only way that this guy happened to escape is because one of his buddies ran over with another rifle, distracted the monster, then shot it in the face as it was charging him. They're all a bunch of scientists and, and naturalists on this expedition, so of course they wanted to like examine and document this terrifying creature afterwards. So this particular sea leopard ended up, weighing, or ended up measuring 12 feet, tip to tail, weighed over 1,100 pounds, and when they cut open its stomach, they found three full-grown crab-eater seals that this thing had eaten. Three of them. It's huge. I think you can go still see the skull of this like in some museum in England or something like that. But this is the image that I want you to have of a hostile environment. And believe it or not, this is the same sort of environment that all of us live in. Because not only do you live in a world where you don't belong, not only do you face all the common human challenges of sickness and pain and disease and depression, not only do you have stuff like financial struggles and broken relationships. Not only do you have to suffer from potential social, social alienation or even persecution for your beliefs, not only do you have to struggle with all the sin and addiction and the darkness of your own twisted heart, on top of all of that, you have a spiritual predator who wants to hunt you down and destroy you. Peter says it straight up later in the letter, uh, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Believe it or not, this environment that we find ourselves in as heavenly exiles is more dangerous than Antarctica in 1914. You cannot let your guard down even for a moment. Let that be a reality check for you. When you are in exile... You must conduct yourself with fear. It's reality check number two. Reality check number three is in verse 18. If you don't conduct yourself in fear, then you don't realize the futility of your default way of life. Verse 18. Knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers. 
Now, this would actually be a pretty shocking verse for the first people reading Peter's letter because that whole phrase, ways inherited from your fathers, all, all five words, it's actually just one word in the Greek. It's um, patraparadotos. Patraparadotos. Kind of fun to say. That's why I wanted to say it. Almost sounds like an event you would have at the church picnic, doesn't it? You know, first we're going to have the three-legged race. After that, we're going to have the patraparadotos. Well, that is definitely not what came to mind for the Romans when they heard this word, because in Roman culture, that word patraparadotos referred to the way of life that was being handed down from generation to generation, father to son, mother to daughter. And this intergenerational exchange of values is what they saw as the foundation of a stable society. You want to be a good citizen, a good person? then keep in step with the patraparadotas. Live the lifestyle that you inherited from your parents. So to the Romans, this was a very uh, positive, wholesome word. W without the patraparadotas, Roman culture ceases to exist. But right here, Peter uses this same word in about as negative sense as you can. He calls it futile, empty, pointless, without substance. That would be shocking to a Roman reader. The, 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 the Pacha Paratitas, that's our default way of life. It's the, it's the way that we live without even thinking about it. And now you're saying that the way of life that seems most natural and normal to us and everybody around us is futile? Believe it or not, this statement is just as shocking and controversial in our own culture. Not so much the whole don't rebel from your parents' teaching aspect, but this idea that you should intentionally resist acting the way that feels most normal and natural to you and everyone else around you. The primary mantra of our culture is, be yourself. You be you, man. You be you. The underlying assumption of this mantra is that however you were born, with whatever quirks or desires or tendencies nature gave you, that's how you're supposed to live. You know, it's not a matter of becoming the person you're supposed to be. It's about discovering the person that you already are and living that way. Well, Peter's teaching here, it flies right in the face of that philosophy. You are not born good. You're born evil. And so were your parents and your parents' parents before them. Your default way of living, the way that you'd go through life if you are just on autopilot, the way of life handed down from your forefathers is futile. If you just follow your natural inclinations, you're on a path to destruction. This isn't just true of some people, by the way, you know, those who are born with particularly odd inclinations or desires. It's true of all people. In fact, as a rule of thumb, you could almost just always do the opposite of your natural desires and you'd probably be a better person for it. If you're born that way, you probably shouldn't live that way. That's why the stuff that Peter says in this letter about God is, is such incredibly good news. Because if you're someone who's decided to follow Jesus, then you don't need to follow the pointless way of life that you inherited from your fathers. You have a new father. He's, he's a heavenly father who's adopted you, made you reborn, and given you a new way of life. If you're someone who belongs to Jesus, you don't just kind of have to sigh and sit, shrug your shoulders and say, what can I do? You know, I'm born this way. No, because Peter says there's good news. You've been reborn another way, and the Holy Spirit will give you the power to live it. So make this your reality check. If you just coast through life the way that feels natural to you, you are headed for disaster. Remember that your default way of life is futile, and conduct yourself with fear. Reality check is in number four is in that same verse, verse 18. You don't have to despair about the, you know, your old, natural, pointless way of life, because somebody has ransomed you from it. You were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers. What this means, literally, is <laughs> that you've been purchased. Someone has paid the price for your life, and now you belong to that person, not yourself or anyone else. This sort of thing could actually happen to slaves in the Roman Empire. If, if you wanted to purchase a certain slave's freedom and the owner agreed to it, what you could do is you could deposit some of your money into the temple treasury of one of 
you know, the local gods, whatever, in the area. And one of the temple priests, who was then acting as that god's representative, would pass that money that you put in there on to the owner of the slave. And the whole thing was basically set up to make it look like that god was purchasing the, the slave, kind of would save the owner some face in their culture. Now that slave would then be free in the eyes of the owner and in the eyes of society, but technically a slave to that God who had purchased them. This is exactly what Peter is saying that God does for everyone who puts their trust in Jesus. He buys you. Jesus pays the ransom to the temple. You're released from your slavery to sin, and now you belong to God. If you don't conduct yourself with fear, then you don't realize who owns you. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You've been ransomed. So you need to be careful how you conduct yourself. You know, you might just trash your own car every time you drive it. You know, your back seat might just be completely buried in McDonald's wrappers, your front seat's moldy with coffee stains. And as far as I'm concerned, you know what? That's fine. It's your car. You can trash it as much as you want. But if you're driving your father-in-law's Mustang with pristine leather interior, custom-carved dash, you better conduct yourself with a little bit of healthy fear. Know what I'm saying? You don't own that car. You don't have a right to trash it. Same thing is true of yourself. You don't own yourself, so you can't just conduct yourself any way you want. You belong, your, you belong to Jesus, so you need to conduct yourself with fear. Especially if you know the ridiculous price that Jesus paid to buy you. Verse 18, you were ransomed not with perishable things such as silver silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is the fifth and final reality check in our passage today, and Peter takes all three of these last verses to flesh it out. If you don't conduct yourself with fear, then you don't know what someone paid for you. I've mentioned before that my wife has a very wealthy uncle who lives in New York City, and a couple of years ago, we visited uh, him at his place on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. On her first night there, her uncle asked if I could help him move some art from the downstairs living room up to one of their upstairs storage room. And I said, oh, sure. He said he didn't want it to get wrecked, you know, with company there. Totally understood. So I followed him into the living room. And when we got there, he asked me to move this kind of weird-looking, kind of oblong leather chair that was in one of the corners. And I was like, okay, sure, but uh, when are we going to move the art? He said, what do you mean? I said, I thought you wanted me to help you move some art. And he said, oh, you're looking at it. And he pointed to the leather chair. And my uncle went on to explain that this was not a chair, but it was actually a -a one-of-a-kind sculpture made by a prominent European artist. I had not heard of him. My uncle had bought it at an auction the previous year for just north of $40,000. But... He added that he estimates now the worth is a lot closer to six figures. I had to do some math. Six figures is actually about (laughs) $100,000 for a leather chair. So let me ask you, how do you think I treated that chair as my uncle and I carried it up the stairs? You know, how watchful was I when we rounded the corners? How careful was I to make sure that I really had a good grip? on my side, but not too good of a grip, you know, to leave any sort of imprints. Oh, yes. I conducted myself with great fear. And it's because I knew that that chair didn't belong to me. And second, because I knew the ridiculous price that had been paid for it. So let me ask you, do you know the price that was paid for you? You know, we just established the fact that you've been ransomed, that you no longer belong to yourself, but Do you have any idea what you're worth? Because Peter tells us the price right here, and it makes that $100,000 chair just look like a bargain. Because you were not purchased with silver or gold. You were purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. 
you know, material wealth, that can be lost, that can be stolen. Silver and gold, it can rot away if you give it enough time. But the price of someone's life, that, that's something that can never be taken away. And Jesus' life wasn't just any life. Peter says that he was like a lamb without blemish or spot. So what this means is that Jesus was morally perfect. He always did what was right. He never did what was wrong. If there was ever someone who did not deserve to die, it was Jesus. But that's actually why he lived, was to die in your place. Peter says that he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. This means not only that Jesus has existed forever, not only is he eternal without beginning, without any end, but even before creation itself, he was making plans to save you, to be condemned so you wouldn't have to be. And after he did this, after Jesus died on the cross to pay your ransom, God raised him from the dead. He gave him glory, glory that nothing in this world can even hold a candle to. If, if, if you were to see the living Jesus right now, standing at the right hand of God the Father in all of his splendor, you would never see anything the same way ever again. This is why Jesus, just one man, can save so many people with his one death. Jesus is an infinite being, so his death is of infinite value. And if that's the case, so are you. Keep in mind that as far as I could tell, <laughs> there was really nothing special about that leather chair that my uncle had. You know, it looked comfortable. Had leather on it. It's always a little pricey. I would be, I'd be guessing like 150 bucks tops at Ikea, you know. But the reason why that chair is so valuable is because that's the price that someone is willing to pay for it. It's not inherent value, it's ascribed value, and so is yours. Your worth isn't through the roof because, you know, you're something super special. It's because that's what Jesus is willing to pay for you. He's the one who is special, and it's his love and his sacrifice that gives you more value than you could ever imagine. Go ahead and underline these words in your notes or in your Bible if you have them. For the sake of you. Those might be the, to me, those words are just the most shocking in this entire passage. Because as, as mind-blowing as all that stuff about Jesus is, you know, his, his perfection, his eternality, his glory, the craziest thing about him is his love. Jesus did all of this for the sake of us who through him are believers in God. You know, I sometimes wonder what it would be like if there were some sort of antiques road show for people. You guys remember that show, right? Any antiques road show fans in here? It's the one where people bring up like the old junk that they found in grandpa's basement and, or at a flea market. And then, and then they have it appraised on air. You know, I used to watch this with uh, Stephen and Cheryl Ford all the time. When I spend the night at their house growing up, it was a lot of fun. It was hard because they would watch the British edition, so you kind of had to convert to pounds in your mind if you were going to try to guess beforehand. Very difficult. Anyways, what if there was a version of this show where you could bring people on it and the hosts would tell you what they're worth? You know, oh my, that's a very rare example of an Irish-American dairy worker. We haven't seen one of these since 1994. You're looking at somewhere between 20 and 25 grand at least. Kind of interesting to watch, wouldn't it? I mean, I'd probably watch it. But to be honest with you, passages like this in the Bible would completely ruin that show. I mean, think about it. Imagine pulling your old crazy Uncle Ned onto the show with you. You know, yeah, I, uh, I just found him lying around in the basement. Thought I'd bring him in for an estimate. Kind of forgot he was down there, to be honest with you, under some old fishing tackle. But we cleaned off the dust. Now here he is. What do you think he's worth? Imagine your shock when the host of the show goes wide as a sheet. He grips you by the arm and says, do you realize what you have here? We have it on very good authority that there is a collector willing to pay an extraordinary sum for a man like this. We're talking an unprecedented price. Believe it or not, your crazy Uncle Ned is worth the precious blood of Jesus. There is no higher price that could be paid. There is no higher value that could be placed on us as individuals. Therefore, 
conduct yourself with fear. Every time that you interact with one of your kids or with your spouse or with your roommates, you are handling a priceless object. Every time that you choose to dabble in sin or to flirt with darkness, you are defiling a priceless object. You know, if I'm careful with my uncle's hundred grand chair, how much more careful should we be with each other and with ourselves? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So there you have it. It's five good, solid reasons why you should conduct yourself with fear. If you realize what sort of father you have, if you realize the danger of your environment, if you realize the futility of your default way of living, if you realize that you belong to someone else who spent a staggering sum of money to purchase you, you will conduct yourself with fear. Lack of fear can be a symptom of ignorance, and nobody here has that excuse anymore. You've been informed. But that does not mean that you're safe. Because unfortunately, ignorance isn't the only cause of a dangerous lack of fear. Lack of fear can also be caused by familiarity. I told this story earlier of how I crashed my car into the ditch the first time I drove in the snow. That was December 2007. So I want you to fast forward now five years into the future to December 2012. I was driving over Snoqualmie Pass with my buddy, Stephen Stabbert, my other friend, Landon Link. We had just had this awesome duck hunt in eastern Washington. We're driving back home with a bunch of birds in the back of the car, feeling great. The pass was a little snowy. Not a big deal. I had had a lot of snow driving experience by this time. Driven over that pass in near whiteout conditions at least a dozen times over those four years between the last incident. Never had an issue. I had learned my lesson from the previous wipeout. I no longer hit the brakes while going down icy hills. Knew what I was doing. I was a seasoned pro. Yet somehow we once again ended up in the ditch. And this time we had to wait over four hours before a tow truck could pull us out. We actually missed our home church Christmas party. We were really, really disappointed. My problem that time was not ignorance. I knew the dangers of snow driving, all that stuff. I knew it really well. My problem this time was familiarity. I had known these dangers for so long. I had overcome them so many times. Figured I was immune to them. Snow driving? Psh, no problem. I got this. And then we ended up in the ditch. For many of you today, what we studied here, these five reality checks, pff, nothing new to you. You know, you've known all that stuff about God as the judge, the danger of the world around us, the price Jesus paid for you. I mean, you started believing that stuff years ago. You still believe it. The problem is that it's become familiar. You know, and, and as a result, you've lost your fear. What I'm saying is, if that's you, if you've been a Christian for like four decades have more badges on your Awana vest than a four-star general. Yeah. You actually may be in just as much danger as someone who's ignorant of all the doctrines that you know so well. Because living in fear isn't about just about knowing what's true. It's remembering what's true. To live as you should, remember what's real. That's how I summarize the main point of your pa the passage today in your notes. To live as you should, remember what's real real. That's why Peter has these reality checks today in our passage. He's writing to people who are already Christians, some who are just starting out as followers of Jesus, some who've been following Jesus for a while now, and both groups need the reminder. You know, how differently would I have driven over Snoqualmie Pass that day if I had spent an hour watching videotapes of car crashes in the snow before start, you know, getting in our vehicle? How cautious would I have been if I had actually taken the time to test the road conditions in a parking lot or something like that, just to remind myself how dangerous it really was out there. That's the sort of thing that we need as human beings, not just to know what's real, but to constantly remind ourselves what's real on a daily basis. This is really what it means to prepare your mind for action. Like Peter says in verse 13, what Bruce preached on last week, to be sober-minded. 
you give yourself a daily reality check. You remind yourself what's really real about God, about you, about other people, about the world around you. That's how you guard against familiarity. That is how you conduct yourselves with fear. Tell you what, though. It's a lot easier said than done. I mean, how, do, how do you remind yourself of these truths? How do you keep the reality of the conditions that you're living in at the front of your mind at all time? What sort of habits or structures can you place in your life that will keep these truths fresh and vivid in your consciousness? Well, that is for you to figure out, actually. I, it, it could be a different process for every single person in here. So you'll see on your notes there, down at the bottom, I, I have some questions listed out that are designed to help you think through this. You've probably noticed that I just love giving out homework. And part of the reason I do this is because I know that real, lasting heart change usually doesn't come about just as the result of a one-shot, 45-minute sermon, boom, you're a different person. It can happen that way. But I've noticed that the Holy Spirit is not always super big on just quick-fix solutions. You need to partner with him by giving these things some, some real honest thought. So that's what I hope that those questions help you do. Yes, it takes worth work, but yes, it is truly, truly worth it. To live as you should, remember what's real. Because when you do, what you're going to discover is that appropriate fear is the pathway to true devotion. And devotion is the gateway to knowing Jesus and knowing joy. So pray with me, please. Father, when we think about the world that we live in, when we think about the weakness of our own hearts and the challenges and the temptations that we face on a daily basis, and when we think about the fact that you have given us your name, that you have adopted us into your family. Father, we need to conduct ourselves with fear. We ask for your forgiveness for the times that we've just been too nonchalant about it, when we've just coasted through life on autopilot. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would keep these truths fresh in our minds, that you would help us to see clearly, not a distorted view of reality, but the world as it really is, you as you really are, us as we really are. And in light of that, that we would live our lives the way that we should. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.